Now that we're about a year on since the release of the faux dating sim horror game Doki Doki Literature Club, I want to talk a little about the experience that this game provided and how it presented two different modes of horror, one far more successfully than the other. This short essay will of course include spoilers, if you haven't already experienced the game. I feel that it's somewhat hard to avoid spoilers at this point though. The one sentence plot summary can be condensed pretty quickly. Doki Doki Literature Club is a horror game that initially masquerades as an anime dating sim, starting out extremely cliched and saccharine, then rapidly switching to blunt and abrasive horror. The predictably tropey characters add to the initial presumption that you're not playing anything too complex. A peppy, somewhat overly cheerful girl next door type, an introverted bookish type, and a standoffish sundere are presented as three potential girls to date in a Japanese-esque school club. This is presided over by a too perfect mentor figure who serves as a partial narrator and provides the tutorial and metagame information. There are a few initial mechanics that present themselves with some unique quirks, that instead of directly picking a girl to obsessively seduce and run out of dialogue options with, the game has you pick words to write a poem, and then in sharing your mode of self-expression with one of the girls you're presented to form some type of emotional bond. It's still contrived, of course, in the way all dating simulators are, but in my opinion, this is a step in the right direction. This facade of a light-hearted dating sim quickly starts to dissolve away when you interact with the different characters more, and instead you're presented with a very human, very touching story of Sayori, the overly cheerful girl, presenting a false face to the world while she struggles with her mental illness. She fails to manage her internal feelings of self-hatred and shame, and, in a genuinely impactful and emotionally engaging scene, she cries in the protagonist's arms as she realises her sadness and depression won't go away. She confesses her feelings for the protagonist, though, given that it doesn't really matter either way if the protagonist reciprocates that or not, the romantic aspect of this scene is not really the main point. The main point is that she is unable to cope with her feelings and starts to spiral into despair. As much as other romantic media may portray the contrary, this game engages directly with the fact that sometimes love does not conquer all. A teenage relationship is no substitute for professional help when it comes to mental illness. No matter what choices you make as the protagonist, Sayori continues to feel worthless and emotionally wrong internally. There are a lot of very well written parts to this character, things that are initially presented as funny quirks. Her messy room, her constant lateness, turn out to be caused by her depression and the apathy that such mental illness can bring. Her cheerful mood is a genuinely well-meaning cover to prevent others seeing how unwell she is. Her internal narrative and understanding of the events around her is one of self-hatred, and her means of engaging with herself is self-punishment for presumed transgressions that she cannot fully understand. Perhaps the most important thing, though, is that she isn't presented as morbid and dreary and self-involved, but instead is selfless, but selfless in a pathological, broken way, in which she wants others to be happy and not to care about her, because she doesn't feel that she's worth being cared for. She explicitly states that she sees herself as weak and selfish, and believes her emotions are a punishment for this weakness, and can see no other valid explanation for her suffering. She is unable to comprehend her own sense of worthlessness in any other way, an aspect to depression that is common particularly if it comes on during childhood or adolescence. You're shown a touching and genuine scene in which the protagonist tries to reassure and give support, but is shut down fairly quickly. Despite wanting to provide her support to make her feel better, Sayori plainly isn't capable of feeling better. She tells the protagonist there is nothing he can do. The protagonist still attempts to provide support, but ultimately, despite your best efforts, things continue to deteriorate. Sayori commits suicide the next day. There is no means to save her. There is nothing you can do to prevent it. And, to finally drive home the point of how significant an event this is, you cannot undo her death by reloading a save. Your agency as a player is stripped from you, and due to the meta aspect of the game, any attempt to undo it is thwarted and prevented. This is emotionally impactful, and I do appreciate the writing of this. Sayori's character is simplistic but still emotionally engaging, and her frank and honest descriptions of her experiences with depression come off as tragic without being contrived. So, here is where the game begins to change tact, and in my view it loses sight of the horror it initially created. You're presented with a repeated scenario in which you're prompted to join the literature club, but Sayori herself is missing from the game. Instead, you have two remaining characters, 
the bookish introvert and the irritable Sundere, as well as the metagame Hostess character. Events repeat themselves over again, but without Sayori, things are presented as a sort of reverse It's a Wonderful Life, in which everything falls apart without her influence. Things become steadily more strange, with characters referencing horror novels, barely contained self-harm, and eventually the game presents false quote-unquote glitches that effectively act as jump scares. There are subtle changes in some of the dialogue, small enough to make you think that you should doubt what you remember of your first playthrough, and that you missed some obvious sign of the impending horror, though the speed at which these ramp up from the sublime to the ridiculous quickly dispel that doubt. The game changes further. More sudden onset glitches are presented, characters become more violent and less coherent, and it seems that everyone has a sudden quote-unquote psychotic breakdown. This is revealed to have all been caused by the metagame hostess character, Monica, who regards all the other girls as fictional characters in a video game, despite also being fictional herself, and doesn't care if they die. Tricks within the game, in a similar vein to Undertale, are presented as this antagonist character manipulating your computer to her own advantage, and ultimately she becomes yet another anime trope. An obsessive Yandere who is willing to murder in order to get to the object of her feelings, you, the player. Eventually, you're prompted to use your own metagame ability, deleting a file within the game directory, and with that you undo the damage of Monica and restart the plot all over again, without the antagonist taking over. But, frustratingly, there's a follow-up scene. The metagame knowledge Monica had is passed on to Sayori, and she becomes an obsessive Yandere too, thus prompting the tragedy to recur over and over. And so, in the final scene, Monica resorts to deleting the entire game wholesale, and thus ends the cycle of suffering. Whilst I think the jump scares are used effectively to provide a scary atmosphere, and there is something to be said for the music and the visuals and meta what if this game is sentient aspects aid that, this is still relatively shallow stuff. This is atmosphere without content, this is horror in packaging and hollow in substance. Maybe you enjoyed the latter part of the game, and that's valid in my opinions are subjective and it's valid to disagree with them. But I think that there was something very fundamental that changed in the portrayal of horror within the second half of this game, and I think I can point out to pretty much exactly where it happens. Within the first half of the game, you're presented with a very real and very disturbing horror, and no, I'm not talking about the image of Sayori hanging herself. I'm talking about the prelude to that, about the hopelessness of the entire scenario. Someone you care for has a mental illness that you have no ability to alter, and despite all your best efforts, they still continue to deteriorate and eventually die by their own hand. The horror in this isn't that mental illness is bad and wrong, but that it's heartbreaking and gut-wrenching to see someone you care for suffer in a way that you cannot alleviate. There is a slow, heavy sense of futility that accompanies this, and your own lack of ability to even help during this entire process is one of the most horrific things a human being can endure. This is a powerful message, and I appreciated how the first act took this seriously. But then Act 2 shows up, and then the characters start to act in a far more bizarre way and become more and more inconsistent with their previous characterization. They appear to become unstable for no discernible reason, and eventually act in ways that are incomprehensible to the player, ways in which they merely become vehicles for yet more jump scares and tired Halloween tropes. Their characterization begins not to matter. All that matters is how that characterization can be manipulated to give a few brief moments of terror. And then, at last we get to Monica's confession, the part where, in my view, it all comes crashing down. She overtly tells the protagonist that she altered the game files and that, in an odd meta-narrative way, she altered the characterization of the other girls by tweaking some numbers and turning up some nebulous emotional instability scale. Instead of being provided an experience where we come to empathize with a mentally unwell character, and the horror is to do with how we can't help them despite our best efforts, we're presented with a cheaper, meaningless experience in which mental ill health is attributable to an unseen emotional instability slider, and mentally unwell people are objects of horror that we are scared by rather than people that we can empathize with. The first type of horror, the horror of hopelessness, is far more poignant and real and emotionally hard-hitting. Horror is often defined as the disgust and revulsion after an event has happened, and in this case the revulsion is at our own lack of ability to help. The second half of the game isn't really even horror at all, it's terror. It's built around the anticipation of scary things happening, but it reduces its characters to meaningless objects in order to do so, and, more significantly, reduces mental illness merely as a vehicle to convey that terror. In short, I admire the attempt made to engage with mental illness and the concept of powerlessness, as short-lived as it is. Unfortunately, though, 
it does seem that anything other than simple depression is still too complex a beast for the video game industry to handle right now. And I think that's a shame, given how much potential for empathy that video games as a medium have to offer.